Women Taking the Lead, episode 83. I have so many balls in the air all the time that sometimes I overwhelm myself. And so I just have to take that five minutes a day just to be quiet. And then somehow, magically, it all seems to come into clear focus for me. Hello, my name is Jody Flynn and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. Head over to womentakingthelead.com to get the solutions to your top five leadership challenges. Now, your future awaits, so let's get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Gail Brown, who is the co-owner of Cold Hollow Cider Mill in Waterbury, Vermont. She has 15 years of experience running the family business with her husband, Paul. The mill is a popular tourist destination that welcomes more than 350,000 visitors a year. She has a bachelor's degree in geology from the University of Vermont, where she was also the captain of the 1979 ski team. Okay, Gail, that's only a little intro for everyone. So tell us more about you and your own humble beginnings. Well, um, Jody, first, I'm, I'm just completely humbled to be asked to be on your podcast here. Uh, I am the oldest of, of four, four kids, so I have the oldest child syndrome, I guess you, you'd, <laughs> you might say. Um, and my when I, when I was growing up, as a young child in the 70s, there, there wasn't any football or soccer or lacrosse or baseball for girls. And I really gravitated towards skiing because my dad was a, a hobby ski instructor at a small ski area that was two miles from our home. And he taught there all the time so that we could get free passes to ski. And I wasn't I think my uh, my my biggest fear was school and academics. I never felt like I was um, the academic type. I remember being in first grade and my my best friend being in the really great reading group that had the small font print, and I was still in the reading group that had the big font. And I uh, I just wanted to ski. And my parents were brave enough to allow me to go to a special ski academy when I was 16. It was really a, an experiment at the time up in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont called Burke Mountain Academy. And the headmaster there had offered me a, a, a scholarship to go full, full time there. And it, it was a non-graded system. And that appealed to me a lot, <laughs> to be in school with no grades. And um, anyway, from there, I, I started, I just skied full time and went to school about four or five hours away from my home. And when I was 16, I, at the end of that year, I got a really bad knee injury. And things really, really changed from there because I... I wasn't able to really get to the place I wanted to go uh, at that age with 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 my athletic career, and that's when I found myself at the University of Vermont, and uh, really struggled academically, having come from a non graded system. Uh, that uh, in terms of what I was going to study and. Uh, was I going to be able to even get through college type of thing? And I, I found that I, I really was interested in geology because it, it just was something that I gravitated to. It was just something that inst instinctively I really loved uh, the thought of studying the earth, let's say. And um, the problem with that, though, was that I, I realized that after graduating, to do anything in the geological uh, world, I was really going to have to go on to grad school, which I, I just didn't have it in me to do. And, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't want to go to grad school, um, and I found myself 
wondering, oh my, you know, you're in your, your 20s and I, while I had a BA in geology, I just knew I wasn't going to use that as a career. And it's like, you know, you're on that journey. Well, what am I going to do and how am I going to make a living? And, and I, I always seem to gravitate to small family businesses. I, um, I ended up at one point in my late twenties working for an importer of ski wear and sportswear, which was um, ignited the creative outlet for me. I had to. I was responsible for putting together uh, all the sales materials and training the the sales staff in the U.S. with these lines of clothing that were coming from Europe. And I found myself all of a sudden in Europe telling these very um, trained uh, graphic design artists and, and whatnot what, what I felt that the, the U.S. palette, color palette should be. And I thought to myself, wow, how did I get here, you know? Um, and I, I met my husband in... Um, the late 80s, my late 20s, around the same time. And uh, I was I was still working in that job of, of this sales manager for this importing, importing, um, it, this importer. And I, uh, when we had our, when we, when we found out we were pregnant with our first baby, I, I knew I, I couldn't do, I couldn't be a good mom and, and work this 50, 60 hour a week job that I loved. And I happened to find myself uh, really at a, at a turning point there. And I chose to stay home with our first baby, Mackenzie. And at that time, my husband had uh, gotten transferred to a different ski area. He, he was in the ski industry. And we, that's when we moved to Vermont. And when he lost his job in the, I guess it was the early, uh, early 2000s, 99-2000 time period at the ski area he had been working at, we really went on a journey like, what are we going to do now? Because we had a, a mortgage and two little babies at that point. And I knew eventually I was going to want to go back to work, but I didn't know with doing what. And we we were looking. We a friend of ours was in venture capital, and he he uh, he knew that the cider mill was for sale by the original owners, and we were going to buy it together, uh, the two families. And as we did the due diligence with what at the time was a um, sole proprietorship, so it was very hard to do the due diligence of how it cash flowed. And in the 11th hour, our friends said, you know, I, I don't think this is going to support the, our two families and uh, we're going we're gonna to step out, but I, I want to help you guys get this to the finish line if you're still interested, which we were. And uh, we took a big leap of faith and refinanced our house and uh, sold a bunch of small little little investments we had after being turned down by seven different banks. They thought we were crazy and got a note from the owner, the original owner. And the next thing we knew as of January, 2000, we bought the cider mill. And I, I look back and I, I, I realize what, what people were, how, how crazy people thought we were those first seven years um, it was just all, all hands on deck trying to just make it work. And, uh, it was really scary. <laughs> I bet. My goodness, Gail, I have to say, it's amazing in your story. Like you've already covered some playing small moments, wake up calls, all of that. And we're going to get into the, the specific stories you pulled out for those questions that I want to ask you, but my goodness, it, your story really shows how, you know, you can have a windy journey, right? right? It's fine. All you have to do is put one foot in front of the other and go where you're led next and, and do what feels right for you and you can find success. 
and you have clearly found some success in your life. My goodness, your cider mill has over 350,000 visitors a year. That's tremendous. And I bet you've definitely gained confidence over the last 15 years too, especially in the last eight, because you mentioned well, the first seven years yeah, being kind of crazy. Yeah, it, it, it's, it has, it's been a wild ride. Uh, I got to be honest, we've survived a major embezzlement with our first employee we ever hired uh, 16 years ago, and uh, who was who was in federal prison, by the way, and uh, I, I I remember about five years ago, I took a business and business classes, some business classes up at UVM, and Jody, I there I was back in the back in the classroom, just terrified again. Uh, oh gosh, I hope they don't call on me and. I was looking around me and there's all these executives from Green Mountain Coffee Roasters and Ben and Jerry's and all these big companies and neighbors of ours that are right within the same community as the cider mill. And I remember being so fearful to speak in those classes. And yet after a while, I found myself speaking up and when I would speak. All of a sudden, I realized that these executives were listening to me, and I said, "Why do they? Why, why did you know? They really. I could tell they were really listening, and I think they realized that I, I'm. My husband and I are in right on the ground floor every single day, uh, running a small business, and sometimes uh, what you learn with your MBA. Uh, it sometimes in the day to day it doesn't always translate. You know what I mean, and um, and and I I was like wow. All of a sudden I felt like whoa. I they val they actually value my opinion, and that was a real turning point for me. Uh, that wow, Gail. Even though you don't have all these big degrees after your name, um, you put your head down, and I've and and we work hard and. My husband and I really don't cross pollinate too much, which is nice. The cider mill, it's big enough that uh, if I can't make a decision of something that I happen to be working on, I'll reach to him and we can make the decision really very quickly. But for the most part, we're we're just we're just in in the battle every single day, mm-hmm. hoping that people just show up for work and nothing breaks. Right, right. And Gail, I really want to underscore something in what you said that, and I I try to um, reinforce this as much as I can, that, you know, we don't have to have that special talent, that special skill or ability. We have our own. We don't have to have all of them, but what we each have is a unique perspective, right? And something to offer. We've experienced something that other people have not, that we can speak to, and they want to hear about it, and they want to listen. I think that's what made me very successful in my corporate career was when I just offered my perspective. Like, this is what I'm seeing. Right. These are my concerns. And people wanted to hear that because they wanted to see things from in ways that they couldn't. Right. Right. So, Exactly. So when people offer up their perspective, it actually helps everybody. And that is so great, Gail. And I love that, that you gain confidence in that. Well, now I want you to take us back to your playing small moment, right? That moment in your life when you were undervaluing yourself, oh. although you were capable of so much more. Take us back to that moment and share with us the lessons you learned. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I think my uh, playing small moment was definitely... I the, I mentioned to you that we had gone through a major embezzlement, and for years, um, I instinctively felt that something was wrong. But I was home with two little babies at the time, and I wasn't f- fully working in the day to day of the business with my husband at the time. I was maybe twelve hours a week up there, and as the kids got older, I was up there more and more and more with them. And I re- it was our bookkeeper, and I asked her for just a statement, and and she got really angry at me. And what I realized was, as I reflect back, she was she was really manipulating both my husband and I against each other. And I I didn't feel that our business was worth losing 
uh, our marriage over. And I, at the time, because I was in the fray of two little babies and trying to be a mom and trying to be, you know, help with running this business and keeping laundry done and food on the table, I, I, I really pushed back the instincts that something was a little off. And off about three different times in the early days, my husband would come home and say, gosh, what did, what did you say? What did you say to Voldemort? I, I, call, I refer to her as Voldemort, she who will not be named. <laughs> <laughs> because, because it was, it was such a, a difficult, uh, it was so difficult to go through because she was family. And um, I, I really pushed back push back, push back, push back my instincts that were telling me that something was wrong. And I, I, I remember when it finally came to the surface, I was, you know, I was, I'm now like, I work in the business 60 hours, 50 to 60 hours a week. And I, I, I remember coming to that aha moment where, oh my gosh, Gail, um, you've, you've been manipulated and, and, and there's been deflection and all of this, all of these years that you've, you've really, uh, you, you didn't listen to, you didn't, you didn't move on because I was scared. I, I didn't, I didn't want to lose her as an employee because I felt that would put my husband in a horrible position. Um, I also didn't want to push it because I didn't want my husband and I to have this, this big controversy in front of us. But over the last two years, um, I had, I had, we had talked a lot about it and he could see my, my side of it. And we had made the decision that we were going to restructure, uh, the position and in do, and, and once we made that decision was when it all bubbled to the surface. And I thought, oh boy. Uh, yeah <laughs> lesson, lesson learned <laughs> absolutely oh my goodness I can't I can't even underscore this one enough I think um we too often ignore you know yeah. our instincts yeah. right because we logic our way out That's of them right. no I don't want to fight or no I don't have any proof That's or right. I don't want to create a problem and and then when it all comes out we're like I should have listened to myself right, right? right. I should have <laughs> I knew something well, was up and, and so often our brains can hijack our hearts and I uh I just wasn't listening to my heart and I I've I've since then I I just when I when I'm in a situation where all of a sudden I feel like I'm just having to feel peel back too many layers of the onion to get to an answer, that is an immediate warning for me now because uh, that's what was happening. And mm -hmm. I wanted her. I, I I'm the type of person, Jody, where I always want to make people feel comfortable working at the mill, and I want to make sure they're having. Um, a positive experience and that they feel valued and that we understand that if there's a family emergency, that by all means, that's, that, that is first and foremost to take care of. And, and, uh, I, I real I was taken advantage, I think a little bit of in that regard and then some, um, in this particular situation. Yeah. Man. Wow. Okay, Gail. Now share with us a time in your journey when you had a wake up call, take us back to that moment and share with us the steps that you took that led to your success. The wake up call, the wake up call. Um, well, the, the, the wake up call, I think for me, Jody was when I found myself, uh, in back in class at UVM, taking those business classes just for my own, my own development. And I, uh, I found myself with all of these executives from all of these big companies and neighbors of ours in, in Waterbury center, like Green Mountain Coffee Roasters and Ben and Jerry's and, and suddenly realized for, for the first time in my life, you know what, I may not have all the MBAs and the MDs and whatnot after my name, but what I have to say, I guess, does have some value. And mm -hmm. um, that to me was was a real wake-up call for me and, and gave me quite a bit of confidence in our business after I 
took those classes because I realized, you know what, I don't, I don't have to run, run this company, my husband and I, like, like everybody thinks we should run it. We need to run it the way we, sh- we feel we should run it for our own lifestyle and our, our mm-hmm. quality of life. And, um, and if, if the margins are going to be smaller, then so be it. <laughs> you <I> know. know. <laughs> Right. I just had Laura Roeder from Meet Edgar on and she was saying the same thing that she actually tries to make a practice of not paying attention to what other people in her industry are doing so that she's more focused on doing things that are in alignment with what's good for her and her people and her business. Right, right, right. a more out of the box kind of thinking, I guess. And uh, yes. in fact, uh, a current project, Jody, that I'm working on that's been super fun is um, is our, our hard cider. And for years, people have been asking us, "Well, why don't you do a hard cider?" And and I, you know, we, it was it's just another whole, uh, practically another whole business. Right. And. Um, Anyway, we there's this this wonderful family and neighbor, uh, Boyden Valley Winery that is near near us in Cambridge, up the road about forty minutes, and they make wonderful wine and they grow their own grapes, and they actually have a small tasting room at the cider mill now, and when they moved in, I said, you know, how about how about if we press the cider, you guys can ferment it for us. And then we'll create a taste profile for Cold Hollow, and uh, it's been it's been so much fun. And so they they did it. They they tasted in their winery, their tasting room that's at the cider mill, and it's our taste profile that we call Barn Dance, and mm-hmm. it's just been so much fun. And people are like, oh, well, you need to you need to get this distributed now and you need to sell it in more places. And I'm like, no, this is, this is enough. <laughs> yes. Yes. You know, this, this is good. It, it, it's been a wonderful uh, energy to the building that we sell it in where the winery is and our restaurant that we call the apple core. Um, and it's just been, it, we get a lot of locals now that come around that mm-hmm. eat in the restaurant and enjoy a hard cider or a growler of it to take home or a bottle for the holidays or whatever. And that's, that's been really fun. Um, and, and one idea that I've had after going out to California to visit our daughter is the, the wine industry. They all have these wine clubs. And I said to my husband, well, why can't we just do a hard cider club and just and just do it through our mail order because we already have a robust mail order uh, department where we sell all our specialty food uh, that we that we produce from our cider and our cider syrup that we produce at the cider mill. So why not? Why can't we do that? <laughs> so again, it's out of the box. There's no one really yeah. doing it that way. But we're right on Route 100 where people come and they, they like to taste it and taste our fresh cider as well and, and watch us press the fresh cider. And it, to me, in my heart, it just seems to make sense. Oh, my gosh, Gail. It makes so much sense. And I'm I'm excited just to hear you say that because what kept coming to my mind is there's something to be said for being exclusive. Yeah. Right. That if you want to taste the cider, this particular cider that you come here, come enjoy, you know, travel. Right. Have it be an experience. If you distribute it, I I would make a guess. I don't know the truth, but I would make a guess that if y- you distributed more, you might not get 350,000 visitors a year, <laughs> yeah. right? Right? And it wouldn't be as special. It's kind of like if you have Christmas cookies all year long. Right, right. Then when Christmas comes around, you're like, oh, we having these cookies again? But if it's something that you only make at one time a year, right, it becomes special and more meaningful and the value of it goes up. So, I mean, there are people out there who would say, Gail and Jody, you're crazy. (laughs) You should be distributed and you make so much more money, but at what cost? Right. Too. Yeah. Yeah. And, um... It, uh, it, it's, there is something to be said about just staying small. You're right, Jody. And I, but you know, people come to see us anyway. Um, Route 100 of, of Vermont is where we are. It's right between Ben and Jerry's and the, and the beautiful 
quintessential village of Stowe. And you go right by the cider mill, and a lot of people like to come there, particularly in the fall. We do 45% of our business in 45 days in the fall. And we press our fresh cider on an old-fashioned rack and cloth press, and it's a very inefficient way of doing it. But it it provides such an education for people uh, that that are that are driving by. They love to come out there and watch us pressing it, and they can taste it right there, right off the press. And it's um, there's something to be said, I guess, about an old fashioned way of doing it too. Um, a lot of the larger cider producers will press with with larger. Um, uh, centrifugal fuse sort of methods and press aids to get more out of the um, apple mash and they might even press it twice but we just just press it once and um, a lot of people love coming just to watch us do that and then we we also make our own cider jelly at the site right at the cider mill so we'll take about 700 gallons at a time of fresh cider and we'll boil it down just like uh, you would boil down uh, sap from the maple trees making maple syrup. Mm-hmm. And the natural pectin in the apple, when the acids and the, the sugars are, are, are aligned and, and ripe, uh, the natural pectin in the apple turns it to jelly. And this is how the early pioneers used to preserve their crop. And at a uh, lower temperature, we will pull that, before it turns to jelly, we'll pull it off as this beautiful cider syrup. And that's what we use to uh, produce our cider barbecue sauce and our cider vinaigrette and our cider mustard. And we also use that cider syrup to infuse back into our hard cider. And so the the sweeteners at the mill are are the apples, the, the cider, uh, maple syrup and honey, which are really the holy trinity of everything we do at the at the cider mill. Oh my yeah. gosh, Gail, my mind is blown <laughs> right now. I just want to get in my car <laughs> and go there and try everything. My mouth is salivating right now. It sounds so amazing. It must be so amazing for people to watch yeah. as well. But Next, I want to ask you, we're going to pivot a little bit because I want to ask you about your leadership style because everyone leads a little bit differently and you've been so interesting. I'm very curious, how would you describe your leadership style? Oh boy, Um, my leadership style, mostly by probably example, Jody. Um, My husband, I, I have a hard time when the ladies room is has got an issue or something asking and one of my employees to, to go fix it. Um, so quite often my husband and I are, or or I are doing it. Uh, I think because of that, a lot of it, it it becomes sort of all hands on. We're so blessed. The employees that we have that work for us, that, um, they wear so many different hats and they're, they're not afraid to get their hands dirty either, which I think is maybe because they, they see that Paul and I aren't afraid of it either. Mm-hmm. Um, and for for me, uh, you know, being the, the, the female part of the two of us, I, I tend to really have to communicate clearly. Um, so I, I don't communicate with a lot of email and texting and whatnot. I, I like to just, look, okay, let's pause for a moment, everybody. Let's get these four people, the four of us in the room, and let's just communicate here for a quick 10 minutes. And it is amazing to me how much that can get everybody back on track versus if it goes through an email thread for the entire day and and how so much can get done when you hear the the way people, the, the context of people's voices or the context they're saying something in, in when they when they communicate in person versus um, through through email or a, or even a phone call. A phone phone call is the next best thing for me. But mm-hmm. but I really uh, and 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 we're going a million miles a minute all the time at the cider mill. And my husband will be like, "Oh, you know, we're communicating together all the day." I said, oh, "All the time, all day long." I said, "No, let's just stop here for a moment. 
let's get these, let's get the four of us in the room and figure this out. And it'll take just five minutes. And it's always uh, five minutes that it's so well spent because yeah. people just, uh, it's so easy to misinterpret things or to miscommunicate with just one word. It's just so easy uh, to take things out of context. There's really something to be said for face-to-face communication when you can do it. And I love the fact that you talk about five to 10 minutes, right? It doesn't have to be a half an hour. It doesn't have to be an hour. I don't know who first said meetings had to be an hour because <laughs> they really don't. They really, really don't. Yeah. It's only that the, the amount of time that it takes, let's leave the, the jibber jabber and all of that stuff aside for just a little while. We can connect socially, you know, when the work is done, but for this time, Let's just figure out this one thing or two things, and then we can move on. Right. right. That's brilliant. Exactly. All right, Gail, what is one thing you're working on right now that you're really excited about? Well, that that is right now in this present moment, Jody. I, I'd have to say it was pro- it would probably be the hard cider project um, because I'm actually uh, this this coming weekend. In fact, I have. Someone from Great Britain, Neil Neil McDonald, who is coming over to spend the spend the weekend with us, as well as uh, he he does a lot of work with the University of Vermont, and he he is a real expert on hard cider. And I want I think my next step is I really want to figure out how to marry the knowledge and lore of hard cider from Great Britain with the with with what would work for us in Vermont and uh, the Macintosh apple is 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 the apple that we go to for everything we do at the mill it may it really makes the best fresh cider but the Macintosh apple doesn't always make the best hard cider because you need bittersweet fruit uh, to be at, of uh, bittersweet apples to be added I- into the sweeter fruit uh, to make a, a new taste profile. And the bittersweet fruit provides that really great acid that you need to, for another taste profile. And the acid, the, 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 the fruit we use on Barn Dance is the Macintosh combined with Honeycrisp. Honeycrisp have uh, a good, a, a good enough, high enough acid level that it, it produced a really great hard cider for the first taste profile. But I'd like to, I'd like to figure out another one, and mm-hmm. uh, and I'd like to do it. Being a real cider mill, I don't want to hide the fact that I'm not necessarily, I can't use any bittersweet fruit from Vermont right now because we don't have enough right now to use. So in the meantime, I want to try to figure out how to do that with maybe some bittersweet fruit from Great Britain because you need a very small amount and combine that with our story as Vermonters and, and the Macintosh apple here that we, that we use for everything. Oh my gosh, that's so wild, Gail. I can't <laughs> wait to, to hear about which fruit you figured out would be the perfect. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm wildly curious, like what from Great Britain would be that perfect fruit? Yeah, so keep me there, posted on there that. Are, there, let me tell you, there are thousands of, sure. of, 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 of varieties of bittersweet fruit of apples, thousands. And Neil is also, also doing some work here with UVM and the, the soils here in Vermont to figure out uh, to help UVM and, and and growers figure out, you know, what what are what this what type of bittersweet fruit would be best to grow here in Vermont um, for this for this boom that uh, in the hard cider uh, world that's taking place. Wow! Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Very very intriguing. Yeah. Well, so Gail, now I'm going to do some some quick questions. So just okay. looking for some quick answers for you from you. What is one practice that you have that helps to make you a better leader? A practice, a practice that makes me be a better leader. I would probably have to say that that is taking three to five minutes a day of allowing my brain just to quiet uh, the noise 
I, uh, getting back to when I was a young girl, you know, I, I really think the reason I, I probably didn't excel in the academic world was because I, 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 I think if I was ever tested, Jody, I probably have some form of ADD or something because I, I, I have so many balls in the air all the time that sometimes I overwhelm myself. And so I just, I just have to take that five minutes a day just to be quiet and breathe. And then somehow, magically, it all seems to come into clear, clear focus for me, whatever I'm working on. Uh, but I, I would say it would be taking that five minutes to just be quiet and alone. Mm. And what is one book that you would recommend to a woman to help her develop her leadership? Ooh, that one I have got to say would probably be uh, Crucial Conversations by Carrie uh, Patterson. It And it, it gets back to just what I was saying in terms of taking that five minutes when in all the chaos of when everything's going on at, at the mill uh, to take five minutes just to, to listen to everybody and communicate in, in that five minutes together. And, and Crucial Conversations, that book was really, uh, really the book that gave me the confidence to just stop everything and, and, and listen and have that, that, that quick conversation as a team together to get things back on track. Mm, so that's where that came yeah, from. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Added to the list. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Gail, what advice would you give your younger self? Oh, my younger self. Well, I would say that you know, our, our thoughts are really magnets. And, and if you want something in your heart enough, um, and the heart and the brain are connected. So that, and that and what I mean by that is that it, the brain's not, they're walking together, let's say, the brain and the heart, and, and the brain's not running the show. Um, and I would say that just our thoughts are magnets and that we, we have to trust that, that if you really want something, um, it will manifest. And yet if, and getting back to the negative side of things, if you're if you keep thinking that you're not, you don't have that M M B M D behind your name or or that M B A behind your name, uh, that that it's okay, and and to to not let that affect uh, what what you believe you want to go after. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Absolutely. You know, what I was thinking when you were saying that is your thoughts about yourself impact your confidence level and your self image and your self worth and all of that, which impacts your confidence and your confidence as you go out into the world will attract right, right people and opportunities absolutely. to you. But it absolutely starts with your thoughts. Right. Your thoughts are ultimately what you will attract into your life. So you need to focus on where you want to go, right. you know, who you really are and not get caught up in all the, the crazy minutia right. that goes on right. around and us. Those, those, those real quiet periods that I give myself three to five minutes a day, just calming my mind and letting, letting, it, letting everything connect back and work together and walk together, uh, mind and heart. Uh, is really, it's just so helpful for me. Mm. Now, Gail, share with us a success quote or a mantra and why it has meaning for you. Well, I guess I, I, it would be just our thoughts are magnets. Uh, I, 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 I really brought my kids up on that little mantra um, that, that what, what they, what they're, it, it can be a little scary, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but that's, um, yeah, and not to uh, not to be afraid though uh, of 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 uh, going after what you want. Yeah, I, I, w I would have to say our thoughts are magnets. Yeah, yeah. that's powerful. Yeah. That is definitely something yeah. to keep keep top of mind and just be aware of. Don't let it frighten you. Don't, but be, be be mindful right. of it. Just to be absolutely mindful. That's the key word of it. Exactly. Um, all right. Lastly, Gail, what is the best way for this community to connect with you? Well, I guess the best way would be, you know, at the our the cider mill 
is uh, we've got our Facebook. And I don't have a personal Facebook, Jody. I'm a little old fashioned that way. I'm embarrassed <laughs> to say. Um, you know, I have my email at the cider mill, Gail B at Cold Hollow, um, and our and just calling me direct at our at our eight hundred number. Um, but that would probably be the easiest way. Yeah, and we have the link to your website on your show notes page as well. So yeah. for those of you listening, you can find all the links and resources shared in this episode at womentakingthelead.com or you can use the short link, which is womentl.com. And Gail, thank you so much for taking the time to inspire and enlighten us. We're all better for having met you. Oh, Jody, well, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. Were you inspired to take some action today, but maybe don't know where to start? Or maybe you have so many great ideas you can't decide where to focus your attention. Don't let stress or overwhelm stop you from having the career, the business, or the life you want to live. Head over to womentakingthelead.com forward slash coaching or use the short link womentl.com forward slash coaching to sign up for a consultation with me. And to strengthen you on your leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson, so here goes. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining me, and here's to your success.